養殖業の役割、えー、フェアオンラインセミナーにようこそお越しくださいました。えー、私は本日の司会進行を務めます、FAO のシニアアドバイザーの三木博人と申します。どうかよろしくお願いします。聖書に先立ち、いくつか事務的な連絡を差し上げます。本日の会議は、日英の同時通訳が入ります。言語の選択は、皆さんの画面の下のアイコンのところに、通訳のアイコンがあると思いますので、そちらで日本語あるいは英語を選択してください。この後、セッションを進めていきますが、後ほどご紹介する、水産局の、水産部の、えー、マニュアルバランジからプレゼンテーションがありますが、えー、その、それぞれのプレゼンテーションに対するご質問がある場合は、やはり画面下側にある Q&A ボックスの方に、えー、投稿をお願いいたします。えー、質問の投稿の際には、ぜひ、えー、名前と所属先を明示してくださるようにお願いいたします。えー、また、本日の、えー、このセミナーは、えー、録画、録音いたします。後日期間限定で、えー、またあのウェブ上で再現いたしますので、その点ご了承ください。さて、えー、皆さんご存知だと思いますけれども、今年2022年,年は国連が定めた小規模の、えー、小規模伝統漁業、養殖業に関する国際年、えー、略称で国際小規模漁業年というふうに我々呼んでますが、この国際小規模漁業年は、小規模伝統漁業、あるいは養殖業の認知度を高めていくこと、また、食料安全保障と栄養の促進、そして貧困削減、また、天然資源の持続的な利用への貢献を支援し、まあ、そして、小規模漁業の持続可能性を促進することを目的としています。えー、そして、ご承知の通り、昨年は、えー、食料と栄養をめぐる議論が活発にされた年でした。9月のフードシステムサミットがあり、また、12月には、東京栄養サミットが行われ両、両者のサミットでは、食料システムの変革が大きく呼びかけられました。そこで、今回のセミナーでは、食料システムの変革と、小規模漁業と養殖業のやっぱりの重要性について、FAO の水産部門の部長である、エマニュエル・バランジュ氏に発表してもらう予定です。私の背景はいつもは森林なんですけど、今日は、海にしてみましたぜひこのセッションを炎上してくださいそれではセミナーに先立ちまして FAO 中日事務所長の日比エリクよりご挨拶申し上げます、えー、日比さんよろしくお願いしますはいあ皆様、えー、こんにちはおはようございます<笑> FAO の日比です、えー、本日は FAO のオンラインセミナー持続可能な食料システムとにおける漁業と養殖業の役割にご参加いただき誠にありがとうございますえちなみに私今アメリカの中西部からつながっております、えー、最も海から離れたところなので、えー、逆に三杉さんとはあ逆にですね背景はまドライな世界です、えー、とちなみにちょっと声があのおかしくなっておりますお聞き苦しいことがあると思うのでご了承くださいさて、えー、現在、我々は2030年までに持続可能な開発目標を達成するための行動の10年に入っています。しかし、すべての人を養うだけの食料が生産されているにもかかわらず、世界の飢餓人口は8億を超え、減るどころかむしろ増加傾向にあります。人類のほぼ半数にあたる30億人は経済的な理由から栄養バランスの取れた食事をとることができません。紛争、極端な気候、経済停滞やショックといった、まあ、食料不安や栄養不良をもたらす要因は貧困と深刻な不平等によって一層悪化しています。その一方で、生産された食料の約3分の1がロス、廃棄されています。つまり、世界の食料システムには大きな歪みがあるのです。もっと環境への負荷を軽減し、えー、持続可能で誰も取り残さず、ショックに強いシステムに変換することが急務です。先ほど、三木が申し上げた、さまざまな昨年の国際的なイベント、例えば、あの食料システムサミットや東京栄養サミットなどでは、まさにこのようなコンセンサスがより明らかになりました。えー、また今年はその小規模伝統漁業と養殖業の国際にですねで、世界の捕獲漁業に従事する人の大多数は小規模零細漁業者と言われます。
えちなみに私は以前滞在しておりました太陽州島し国の多くでは、えー、小規模沿岸漁業者が地域の生計を維持、えー、沿岸の海洋資源の持続可能な美容に重要な、えー、貢献を果たしていました。本日は水産という分野が、えー、栄養改善、貧困解消や持続可能な成長を実現する上で、どのような役割を果たすことができるのか。その可能性についての国際社会の最新の理解について、FAO 本部の水産部長、バランジュがお話しいたします。どうぞよろしくお願いいたします。はい、えー、日比町長ありがとうございました、えー。では本日のスピーカーのマニュアル・バランジュ氏を紹介します。えっと、マニュアルは海洋生態系を専門として、まあ、おそらくかなりその調査・研究の経歴が長いというふうに私は理解していますが、FAO には2016年から参加し、現在は水産部の部門長として、政策立案やルールセッティングに尽力されています。So, good morning, Manuel. It is great to see you again. So, thank you for giving your time to joining this seminar. So, I'm very much happy to welcome you here. So, please give your presentation. The floor is yours. So, Manuel, you are muted. Oh, uh, <laughs> arigatou gozaimasu, <laughs> Mitsugi-san,、um, Hibi-san. Thank you for the invitation to talk to you today. It's、uh, a pleasure to, to be with you, at least、uh, virtually.、Um, we don't travel so much anymore,、uh, but it is, in fact,、uh, quite nice to know that in just this week, I've been able to give lectures in Portugal, Angola, Dubai, and today in Japan. Thanks to this technology that we've become so used to.、Um, I will talk to you、uh, today about、uh, blue transformation and the role of aquatic foods in ending hunger and poverty in the world. Next slide. Just to begin with,、uh, perhaps a, a bit of understanding of what FAO is. I am talking to you from the FAO headquarters in Rome, which is this building that. Uh, is uh, behind me, and from the very right of the picture, that's where my office is.、Um, and the FAO was created in 1945 to provide technical solutions when 72% of the world was living in poverty. It is difficult to imagine that, but it, that's exactly how the situation was in 1945. At the time, expert opinion was that we couldn't feed a world of three billion people. And as you know, we are seven and a half billion now. But the real challenge for all of us is how to feed a world of 10 billion people by the middle of this century. Everything that addresses this challenge is an opportunity, and fish is an opportunity. Next slide. Now, I just want to bring two very worrying、um, messages to you to begin with. First, Is that the prevalence of undernourishment, the number of undernourished people in the world, and that is the figure on your left, reached、uh, a high in 2020,、uh, potentially up to 811 million people. This is particularly because of the COVID 19 pandemic. This pandemic has actually removed, has obliterated decades of improvements in、uh, nutrition security in the world. And on top of that, if you look at the figure on the right, the food price index that FAO computes every month reached an incredible high in January 2021, and unfortunately will continue to increase in coming months. This puts an enormous pressure on our food systems because we have too many people that are hungry and too many people that cannot afford a healthy diet. And We live in a very difficult week, as you all know. And I just want to mention that Ukraine and Russia、uh, are responsible for 25% of the global trade in cereals, the global production in cereals. And so this food price index will continue to rise in, in coming weeks, unfortunately. The fish price index, however, interestingly, has remained at the global level very stable for the, for the whole of the last decade. And so it provides a source of top food. At an affordable price. Now, these realities were very much at the back of the UN Food Systems Summit that took place last year. And one of the conclusions of the summit 
where and was was a, a recognition that aquatic foods need to be uh, receive need to receive a much higher attention in terms of addressing food and insecurity in the world. Next slide. Now, the reasons for a focus on aquatic foods is, uh, are many, but I will just mention a couple of them. First of all, if you look at the left side of your slide, the conversion efficiency of fish is very large. That means that for every kilogram of feed that we give for two fish, for example, on, in aquaculture, uh, you in increase the um, production of uh, flesh, of meat into the fish compared to chicken, compared to pigs, and compared to cattle. This efficiency is primarily because fish do not have to invest as much into their skeleton body as, as animals on land do, because they live in water and gravity in water uh, has a different uh, pressure. And second, because uh, fish do not have to maintain their temperature, their body temperature, and therefore there's less investment in the metabolic needs. If you look at the right of the picture, the emissions, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions of uh, aquaculture are much, much lower than the emissions of other animal food production systems. And therefore, also from an ecological point of view, it becomes a very effective and environmentally friendly food source. Next. And that is why the UN Nutrition this last year published a report on the role of aquatic foods in sustainable healthy diets that particularly mentioned fish as a superfood because the, of the provision of uh, proteins as well as micronutrients. Uh, the fact that it becomes has become essential for lactating mothers and children. And also because in fact, contrary to some popular belief, uh, of the 30 top consuming nations of fish, 16 are cataloged as low income food deficit countries. So it provides food for the poor. Finally, there is a very large biodiversity uh, in fisheries and aquaculture. As you well know, in Japan, there are two and a half thousand fish and mollusks and crustacean species that we capture in the wild and over 600 that we culture. And so this biodiversity that we use give us more options in terms of climate change adaptation. Next. And having said that, it is a sector that is not really sufficiently recognized and in food and nutrition um, strategies and plans. Now, only about 68 out of 165 public health nutrition policies, so half of the nutrition policies of the world recognize fish and selfish consumption as a key objective for the nutrition objectives. And that is surprising because if you look on the left, fish consumption has grown as the per capita average from nine kilograms uh, in the 1960s to almost 21 kilograms now. So this growth is particularly because of aquaculture. That's the figure at the bottom. You can see how the contribution of aquaculture to our consumption has been increasing very steadily over the last 30, 40 years. And, and this is why we think that we need to start changing the mentality of those in charge of nutrition and food security strategies at country level to recognize the role of aquatic foods. Next. You had in Tokyo uh, a Nutrition for Growth Summit uh, last year that came with very strong conclusions and very clear and very useful conclusions on how to improve nutrition in the world. But I have to say that it was, I was struggling to see aquatic foods really recognized in, in the nutrition for growth uh, conclusions. I may be wrong, but that was my impression. It is a further recognition that we need to up the way that aquatic foods is seen in terms of nutrition. Next slide. So for example, in Japan, this is a complex figure, but if you just look at the two maps on the left, um, an analysis of Japan says that the inclusion of aquatic food uh, are not really considered or very poorly considered in national public health policies. And if you look at the bottom one, this is despite the fact that uh, the national fishery policies do recognize the role of fisheries in food and nutrition security. So there's an imbalance. Uh, the sector 
sees his role in terms of nutrition and food security much more than the nutrition and food security strategies recognize fish and fisheries. Next. So it is partially for these reasons that the FAO started a new uh, priority area work that we call blue transformation uh, started this year and it will continue for the next decade. A strategy to really enhance the contribution of aquatic foods to our food and nutrition security and the recognition of aquatic foods in those in uh, food and nutrition security strategies. Next. It is not coming out of the blue, uh, so to speak. It is coming because countries have also recognized that. Um, as you probably know, the FAO hosts a committee on fisheries every two years where all the countries of the world come together to discuss what things are needed in the sector. And at the meeting of 2021, in February 2021, all countries agreed unanimously and, and through consensus to a declaration for sustainable fisheries and aquaculture that identified what priority areas are needed to further transform aquatic foods and to make sure that we develop a more positive vision for the sector in the 21st century. Next. Blue transformation, the strategy of blue transformation has very clear uh, quantitative, uh, quantitatively measured objectives and targets. The first objective of blue transformation for FAO is to enhance aquaculture intensification and expansion to satisfy the global demand for aquatic foods and to distribute the benefits more equitable. We have a very specific target by the end of this decade we expect to have a 30 to 45% growth in global aquaculture globally, that's an average, with quality foods produced sustainably. This target uh, will be achieved by scaling and transferring knowledge through targeted development, especially in food deficit regions. For example, I can tell you that our projections is that Africa aquaculture will grow by almost 50% by the end of this decade. There are a lot of things that can be done to achieve this objective. We need to improve our use of feeds, uh, use of technological innovations, the use of genetic improvements and diversification of species, uh, secure um, or protect for disease um, and biosecurity risks, and provide regulatory frameworks, and that is for governments to do, to make sure that investment uh, is attracted by the uh, by aquaculture and its possibilities. Next. Now, I can tell you, first of all, that uh, aquatic foods and aquaculture in particular have been beating expectations already for some time. So our projections might be underestimating. For example, in, 20, in the year 2000, um, the, the CGIAR system, uh, the Council for Agricultural Research System, provide a projection, a 20 year projection that was called Fish to 2020 to understand how much we could expect aquaculture to grow. Now that's, this was a pro projection that was done in, 20, in the year 2000 for 20 years forward. Now you can see that in fact, they were 54% short of uh, the actual production. So they, they, project, they, they projected that uh, total fish food would be 130 million tons by 2020. It actually has been 155 million tons. So this is because in general, the models that we were using to project uh, aquaculture growth did not capture sufficiently the impact of unanticipated new technologies, the role of globalization and international trade, and the policy developments on aquaculture and fisheries. So we think that aquaculture can grow by these 35 to 45% by the end of the decade, and we hope to do so. Next. And the main reason for that is because if you look at the total aquaculture production of the world in 2019, that's the pie on your left, more than 80% comes from the Asian continent. So there's a great potential for growth in other regions of the world. Next. 
The second objective of blue transformation is to effectively manage all fisheries to deliver healthy stocks and equitable livelihoods. Now, the target here is very specific to restore all fish stocks to levels capable of producing the maximum sustainable yield. As you know, the maximum sustainable yield is the agreed target in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, in the Sustainable Development Goals, and therefore it is a very uh, fitting target uh, for it. Now, how do you achieve that? Is to ensure effective management of 100% of seas and waterscapes. That might be difficult to achieve, but it is important to recognize that not all resources and not all areas of oceans and seas are under effective management. To achieve that, we need to improve our data collection systems. We need to bring investment back into fishery sustainability. We need to develop assessment and management methods suited to places that have limited capacity and limited data to implement uh, the best possible models. We need to innovate in the way that we monitor, that we control and that we enforce our regulations. We need to make sure that we are ready to adapt to climate change and that we align national management strategies with regional management strategies. Next. Now, why do we focus so much on this effective management? Well, this is one of the iconic figures of FAO that is produced every two years in the SOFIA report, the State of Fisheries and Aquaculture. The number of uh, fisheries that are overfished uh, has reached uh, now 34%. So one in every uh, three fish stocks is overfished. Two out of every three is not. But this number of overfish stocks has been growing. But what we also see um, is the following. If you look at the chart of the right, look at the uh, red line. Now, this is a, a figure that provides an average of biomass, fishing pressure, and catch in approximately 800 uh, fish stocks that are properly assessed and properly managed around the world. And what you can see, if you look at the red line, is that from about the year 2000 or so, the, the biomass of these stocks has been growing. It has been growing because management is working. And what this tells us is that when stocks are under effective management, they are increasingly sustainable. Of course, they will go through ups and downs because we are dealing with nature, but they are effectively uh, sustainable. While stocks that are not under effective management are deteriorating. Next. Now, the third objective of blue transformation is about value chains, is about ensuring that we upgrade them to uh, secure social, economic, and environmental viability of their food systems. The target here is to in increase and provide more inclusive returns of fisheries and aquaculture through less waste less losses at sea, less discards, opening of new markets, and removing barriers to trade, which have been the great um, uh, mechanism through which aquatic foods have really reached everywhere in the world. We need to reactivate some of the value chains that were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We are already succeeding on this, but we need to intensify uh, and provide management solutions um, in addition to modifying value chains and upgrading them. There's lots of things that can be done to achieve this objective, um, add value and develop novel products, provide digital solutions to facilitate accesses to markets, reduce the barriers to trade, but also educate and make consumers aware of the value of aquatic foods to improve their nutrition. And finally, of course, as I mentioned early on, to ensure that aquatic foods are fully incorporated in food security strategies. Next. Now in support of this third objective, I'll just mention that as you probably know, almost 30% of fish and seafood is lost uh, at some point in the value chain. And if we were to reduce this significantly, we would improve the volume of fish available to the consumer without having to increase catches. But also note that the importance of developing the value chains has also an economic component. If you look at the right of the figure, um, the 
the uh, contribution uh, of fish to fish products to trade has grown to from eight billion dollars in 1976 to 164 billion dollars in 2018. And actually, in terms of value, developing countries now receive more than 50 percent um, of that uh, that are responsible for more than 50 percent of that trade. So there's a very strong economic component in terms of developing value chains for fish products. Next. Now, this blue transformation is not just words, it's not just objectives. We actually have modeled what can be achieved if blue transformation is implemented fully. If we implement blue transformation to the extent possible, we think that it is a potential to increase per capita fish consumption uh, by 2050 to 25.6 kilograms per person. That is even though by 2050, we will be 10 billion people in the planet. So it is a very significant increase that we would produce. But if we fail to transform, we think that per capita consumption will decrease to about 18.5 kilograms per person per year because, population, because the supply of, of products will not keep up with population growth. So this is a significant importance uh, for everybody. If we transform aquatic foods and we achieve blue transformation, the pressure on land-based food systems will significantly reduce. And just to understand that, by the end of this decade, we expect that aquaculture will be contributing almost 70% 70, 70 of all the fish, mollusks, and crustaceans that we eat. And this will continue to grow into the future. Next. We've also even modeled the implications of blue transformation for specific nutritional um, characteristics of our, of, of our diet. So this is a complex figure, but we have um, used a database of aquatic food composition in terms of micronutrients, uh, vitamins and fatty acids. And we've modeled these projections of blue transformation country by country, as you can see in the middle of this figure. Again, it's a complex figure and my apologies. But then uh, if you look at towards the right, we've actually been able to see how we will increase daily per capita consumption of uh, fatty acids, of iron, of calcium, of vitamin B12 around the world. This is work published um, in the journal Nature uh, this last year and shows how important it is blue transformation, not just at the global level, but at national level and in terms of very specific nutritional characteristics. Next. Now, blue transformation has other important elements that are less quantifiable, uh, elements that are part of the blue transformation and that become achievable once you achieve the objectives that I mentioned earlier on. Blue transformation is also about livelihoods, about protecting livelihoods, about reducing inequalities, about empowering women and bringing youth into the sector, about small scale producers and how they can increase their contribution to food security, about community futures and about decent work and equity. So those are elements that will happen that will come with the development of blue transformation and is particularly important. Next slide. It's particularly important because this is the year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. The International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture was in, uh, endorsed by the United Nations some time back, and it started in January 2022. There is a collection of events all over the world to um, uh, project and increase the role of, uh, of um, artisanal fisheries and aquaculture um, uh, for food and, and nutrition security. And this is a perfect occasion to kickstart blue transformation around the world. We have a decade to do so. This is also the decade of action to achieve the sustainable development goals. And so we have a decade to secure blue transformation to feed the world and maximize their contribution of aquatic foods to food nutrition and food security. And that's, uh, thank you very much, everybody. You can stop sharing the slides. Well, so Manuel, and uh, so this is a quite nice and also quite a comprehensive presentation on the fisheries and the food systems, also called blue transformations. 
、えー、ありがとうございました、えー、マニュアルの方から、えー、今あの日本の事例やあるいはブルートランスフォーメーションの話を含めて全般的なあのお話をいただきました非常に下に富む内容だったと思います、えー、私自身いろいろあのコメントあるいは質問する思い浮かぶこともあるんですが、えー、皆様の方もいろいろあると思いますであのすでに Q&A ボックスにもいくつか質問いただいてますがもうしばらくご質問いただきたいと思いますのでその間を使ってですねこれから3人の方に今のプレゼンテーションに対するコメントあるいは質問をまずお伺いしたいと思いますまず最初に農林水産庁水産庁資源管理部審議官の高瀬美和子様からあのいただきたいと思います高瀬様よろしくお願いしますはい、水産庁の高瀬です聞こえてますでしょうかはい、聞こえてますはい、えー、水産庁資源管理部審議官の高瀬と申しますよろしくお願いしますまずあの今回のセミナーあの開催にあたりまして、えー、新型コロナウイルスの中ですねあのこのような会議、セミナーを開いていただいたことに感謝を申し上げます。えー、ただいまあのバランジ部長からですね、あの持続的な食料供給システムの実現のためのブルートランスフォーメーションによる水産業の貢献ということについて大変有意義なプレゼンテーションをいただきました。えー、今あのプレゼンテーションをお聞きしてですね。日本の,あの水産業の方向性として日本の政府が考えていることと、えー、ただいまブランジ部長から説明していただいたことに、えー、何もそごはないということを確認して大変嬉しく思います、えー、日本としてもですね養殖業の持続可能な成長それから漁船漁業の持続性の確保、それからバリューチェーンの効率化の重要性といったことを十分に認識をしておりまして、さまざまな取り組みを進めております。この機会にですね、あの日本における取り組みやあの基本的な方向性についても少しご紹介をさせてください。まずあの日本ではですね、2020年に改正漁業法、新しい漁業法が施行されまして、その中でですね、新しい資源管理の取り組みを推進をするということにしております。具体的にはあの資源の調査とか、えー、管理の充実、えー、またあの今バランジ部長の方からも強調をされました MSY ベースのですね MSY を目指した資源管理の推進などの施策を進めて、えー、2030年までにその10年前、えー、つまり2010年とですね同じ程度まで漁獲量を回復させるということを目指しております。またあの2021年にはあの食料、農林水産業の生産力向上と持続性の両立をイノベーションで実現するというコンセプトで,です、ねえー、緑の食料システム戦略というものを作成しております。えー、これはあの農林水産業全体について作成、策定をしたものでありまして、タイトルは緑、グリーンですけれども、えー、ブルーという今、あのバランジ部長がご説明されたようなコンセプトもですねこの中に含んでおりまして、そういう総合的な戦略として策定をしております。その中で、ですね2050年までに日本の水産業が目指す姿と、そのための取り組みの方向というものも定めておりまして、新しい資源管理とともに、ですね天然資源に負荷をかけない持続可能な養殖生産体制を目指して、人工種苗や、えー、配合飼料への転換に向けた取り組みを進めることにしております。また、あの養殖につきましては、えー、別途ですね、あのー、昨年、養殖業を成長産業化させるための総合戦略というものを作成し策定をしております。これはあの需要を踏まえたマーケットイン型の養殖に転換するという、まあ、大きな目標のもとにですね、あの生産や流通、加工、販売などの各バリューチェーンの付加価値を向上させていこうというものであります。これも先ほどのバランジ部長があの紹介していただいた養殖業に関する FAO の方向性とも、えー、全く合致したものであると思っております。またあのバリューチェーンの観点としては、違法に逮捕された水産動植物の流通を防止するためにですね、2020年12月に
、えー、特,定特定水産動植物等の国内流通の適正化等に関する法律というのが成立をしました。これはまだあの法律ができて、えーいわゆる施工期間といいましてあの、実施するための準備をしている段階でありまして、今年の12月にです、ね、あの実際には施工をされるということになっております。えー、日本としまして、あの日本政府としては、これらの政策をです、ね、積極的に推進して、えー、持続的な、えー、水産食料システムの達成に向けて取り組んでいきたいと考えております。またあの FAO をはじめとする国際的な枠組みに日本としても積極的に参加して、えー、水産資源の持続的な理由利用、えーまあ、適切適正な食料システムの構築というものに向けて、えー、貢献をし,していきたいと考えているところです、えー、本日はどうもありがとうございました高橋委員官ありがとうございましたあのそこがないということでちょっと安心しておりますえー、それでは、えー、今、あの政府の方からあのコメントいただきましたので、次に、えー、アカデミアの方から、えー、東海大学海洋学部環境社会学科長の石川聡様からお願いしたいと思います。よろしくお願いします。はい、三、は、月、い、さん、ありがとうございました。ボランジ部長、素晴らしいプレゼンテーション、ありがとうございます。今回あの、ブルートランスフォーメーションという言葉を私は恥ずかしながら初めて聞かせていただきました。ただ、その中で、従来のカロリーベースの生産の評価ではなく、多様な栄養素のもととしての水産業の水産物の価値といったものを強調されてたのが非常に印象的でした。また、その中でバリューチェーンに踏み込まれている。このバリューチェーンに踏み込まれているということは、そこに価値を見出す地域の文化や社会、その価値といったものをこのマネジメントに取り込んでいくという新しい姿勢について非常に感銘を受けたところです。えー、一方で、ただまだあのいくつかおそらく質問も出ると思いますけれども、例えば地球環境全体への影響、ライフサイクルアセスメント的な評価はどう絡んでいくんだろうか、また、えー、自動労働なんかを含むフェアトレードの観点とどう絡んでいくんだろうか、えー、この辺私としてはもっともっと、えー、聞きたいなというふうに思ったところです。えー、多様な資源を多様に使う。多様な文化がそこにある、そこに新しい価値が生まれる、単に生産量だけではなく、そこにある多様な多面性みたいですね、価値、それに対して包括的にマネジメントを行っていくというような方向性の転換かなというふうに思いまして、これについて私も協力していきたいなと思ったところです。コメントつては以上になります。石川先生ありがとうございましたあのもう一方お願いした後にこの後あのマニュアルからリア,クションリアクションをいただきたいと思いますが、えー、最後に、えー、漁業の実践のところにいらっしゃいます、えー、全国沿岸,、えー、沿岸漁民連絡協議会事務局長の三平明様からあのお願いしたいと思います三平様よろしくお願いしますどうもあのこんにちはあバランキさんどうもあのご講演ありがとうございます私もあのブルトランスフォーメーションというのは初めて、えー、聞かせていただきました、えー、大変参考になりましたあの私たちの団体はですね実はあの国連の家族農業年2014年の国連の家族農業年っていうのがありましたけどもそれをあの聞いてですね翌年の2015年にあの日本の沿岸の食料漁業者の方々が集まって団体をあの作りました、えー、日本でですねあの食料漁業者ってのは、まあ、10トン未満の船の方々ですけどこの方々がやっぱりあのこの30年間ぐらいでどんどんどんどんやっぱり減ってきているんですねそれからあの高齢化が進んで若い人たちの後継者が少ないという問題が日本全国で起こってきているので、やはりあの日本はあの島国で、えー、海岸がたくさんあったり、島があったりはあの、交通不便な半島がいっぱいありますけれども、そういうところにも6000ぐらいの漁村集落があって、地域の経済を支えているのは、こういう小さな漁業者の皆さんが、地域の,あの漁村の経済を支えているんですね。ですからこういうい方々があのきちっと元気にです、ね、活動ができなければあの地域は活性化しないということもあるので私たちあのこういう団体を作ってです、ね、いろいろなあの要望を国に出したりも
してます。えー、今あの、スタートするときは1500人ぐらいの漁業者だったので、今、1万8000名ぐらいの組織になって、6年経ちましたけれども、いろいろあの予防ですね、えー、先ほど高瀬さんが出てましたけれども、水産庁さんのコーナーにも出しています。であのやはりですねあの、問題があるのは、日本の沿岸の漁業者の方もですね、えー、と外国、まああの、私はカツオの研究者なんですが、カツオがです、ね、日本へ来遊する量がものすごく減ってきたというところが、この団体を作ったきっかけだったんです。でこれはやっぱり熱帯域で、まあ、企業型の大きなあの、まあ、木網が創業しているということが、かなりあの200万トン近いあの数量を水揚げするということの悪い影響がです、ね、日本の。来る来遊してくるカツオの量を減少させているんだということが私たちの,あの主張で,です、ね、これをあの、えー、水産庁さんなり、えー、日本の国の研究者の方々にどんどんアピールをして、えー、いるという運動をやってきました、まあ、水産庁さんの方もあも来遊量が減っているということをあの分かっていただいて国際的にもいろいろ発言をしていただくというようなことをやってます。あのやっていただいてありがたく思ってます。それからあのやはりあの沿岸漁業者の方にしてみるとやはり沿岸の日本近海のところでですねやはりあの海岸線の環境がですね、えー、やはりあのだんだんと環境が悪化してきたり水質も悪化してきたりそれから海岸線がですねどんどん開発で壊されたりするそういう影響をですねあの小さな業者の方々は非常にあの影響を強く受けてますのでそういうことでえー、だんだんその漁業者が減ってきているということがあ,のあります、そういう具体例はたくさんありますので、やはり環境を大切にするということ、それからあのこう近年、やはりあの海のです、ねまあ、温暖化というんですかね、そういう影響が日本の近海にもあの影響を及ぼしてきて、えー、取れる魚が変化をする中で、沿岸の方々があいろいろあのマイナスの影響を受けているという、こういうような。あのこともありますで,ですからこういうことも取り上げながらですねあの国の方にもですねいろいろ政策をやっていただきながらやはりあの日本の沿岸漁業、まあ、小型小規模漁業の皆さんがですね、えー、後継者がたくさん出てですね地域の産業としてこれから発展できるような形でですね私たちもあの努力したいなというふうに思っています。以上です新平さんありがとうございました、えー、と今あの、政府、それから、えー、大学、また、えー、漁業組合、実践の方の方の視点からそれでお話をいただきました。えー、一旦ここで、あのー、バラージュさんにお返しして、少しリアクションをお伺いしたいと思います。そう、マニュアル、クジョキバスイはインサイト、オーソヤリアクション、プリーズ。And、uh, if I can address、uh, a couple of them. First of all,、uh, in relation to Takasa san,、uh, express my gratitude to the government of, of Japan for your support to FAO and to FAO fisheries work. You are one of our greatest supporters. And therefore, I'm not surprised that your policies are well aligned to the Blue Transformation objectives, because actually, what Blue Transformation is trying to do. Is trying to make sure that we understand what is needed and what are the countries, what countries around the world needing, and align them all together in a particular narrative that resonates with the needs、uh, that they all have. The biggest difference between blue transformation and、uh, some of the national、um, policies and, and, and strategies is that in blue transformation, we have a very specific objective based、uh, strategy. Um, with actual numbers, they are quantitative objectives. So it puts a, a, a bit more pressure in saying this is, how we will, this is where we want to get to.、Uh, the process may be very logical for everybody, but this is the target we need to increase. And, and for that reason, I think the blue transformation is a, a, is, a, is a cry for action for all countries to just recognize the need for blue transformation.、Um, In relation to、uh, Ishikawa san,、uh, I think that it, one thing that is important to recognize you know, is that every food production system has environmental impacts. There are some of these environmental impacts that are very manageable and some that are more difficult to manage. And what we want to make sure 
is that when we recognize an environmental impact that we deal with it. So uh, aquaculture has clearly some environmental impacts, not as big as other food production systems, but it has environmental impacts. They have to be dealt with. You know, the, um, the, in, any contamination of the water, any eutrophication that is produced for the ex excess uh, of food, um, any, any transfer of uh, disease need to be handled. Those are things that can be done. And what is very important is to recognize that they happen and then put the systems in place to regulate them because this is just about regulation and management. Um, he also mentioned about uh, child labor and fair trade. And I think this is very important and it also responds in some way to uh, Nihira San's comment. You know, when we talk about sustainability of fisheries and aquaculture, we don't just talk about so ec ecological sustainability. We talk about social and economic sustainability. And social sustainability also means uh, decent working conditions, uh, proper uh, support to those communities that rely on fisheries and aquaculture, and the fair trade and the fair arrangements are part of that. As you know, um, as I mentioned, the, the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture is starting, but it doesn't start out of nowhere. Before that, we have the voluntary guidelines for sustainable, uh, sorry, for small scale fisheries, the FAO voluntary guidelines that were agreed by member countries. And the objective of those guidelines is to support the fishing communities, the small scale fishing communities for which fishing is more than a food production. It's more than an income generator. It's a way of life. It is the gel that keeps those communities together. So recognition of this extra element that small scale fisheries have is absolutely essential and is part of the, of the international year. Now I have in front of me or have with me the, the global action plan for IAFA, which I encourage those of you uh, that are interested to go to the website and look at them. It has very specific pillars of work to be done. And some of those pillars are securing social inclusion, ensure participation of small scale artisanal fisheries in strengthening policy, uh, ensure gender equality and equity. So the very specific socially focused objectives that try to protect those communities. You know, fisheries is a way of life and it's a very difficult way of life. I've spent many, many months of my life in fishing boats. It's a tough way of life. And it is also, it is also fisheries, the only food production system that relies completely on the natural cycles of the ecosystem. And so always we're gonna have species going up and species going down. But if we have 100% of the species under effective management, we will ride those waves in a much better way. That's why we call for this 100% of resources under management. Um, it's I think for the, uh, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'd like, uh, thank you very much for your comments. I think they are very useful to me as well. え、あの、あの、ちょっと
えー、それではあの、先ほどの質問にちょっと移りたいと思います。えー、とまず最初に、えー、そうですね、えー、愛知学院大学の関根様からの質問ですね。えー、基本で僕は英語で書かれていただいてますけれども、ゲノム編集について、えー、どう思われるでしょうかということですが、えー、この点あの、マニュアルいかがでしょう養殖に関するそのゲノムの編集について、この可否、今後の方向性、お願いします。Yes, thank you for the for the question, and、uh, and and just in fact, in in response to Hida Santelator's comment, I can tell you that the FAO is actually、uh, finalizing a, a study on the contribution of small scale fisheries.、Uh, To food and nutrition security around the world. And one of the conclusions of this study, which is about to be released, is that small scale fisheries contribute 40% of the global catch in fisheries around the world. And they are more than 94% of the workforce in fisheries. So they are only small in the title, they are not small in anywhere else. They are very large in their contributions. And they're very large in the, in the social contributions. And that is why we pay so much attention to small scale fisheries、uh, in Hida san.、Uh, and on the, on the question specifically on genetics,、um, so in, in FAO, we actually last、uh, two years ago, we completed a study of、um, the state of the world of aquatic genetic resources, how genetic resources are being used, in, in, particularly in aquaculture. And、uh, what we noticed in that analysis is that the species that we culture do not differ very much from the species that we capture. So the aquaculture species are very similar to the wild species.、Um, this is not the case in, in other animal production systems, of course.、Um, so we, we foresee that over time, there's going to be a little bit of a diff- distance between the wild populations and the cultured populations. How do you achieve that? Um, there are very simple ways of doing it that are very effective. First of all, by starting、um, by improving genetically、uh, the strains that you culture without having to do genetic modification, just through hybridization and, and, and general,、um, g- general culturing, S- slowly picking up、um, the strains that are more efficient. This is already happening in many places. I, I was in Saudi Arabia. Three weeks ago,、uh, looking at、uh, some culture of shrimps where they already have、uh, used a strain that is very different from the wild strain and that produces a maximum production and maximum resistance to disease, for example. So, this is what we, we, we are seeing and we think that we need to, to in, improve. That is one element. The second element is to use more local species for local conditions. Rather than use the same species everywhere, you know, like tilapia, for example, as the most common uh,、um, uh, species being cultured, or fish species, or one of the most common species being cultured, we want to make sure that we also use other species locally. So that's what we see as the first step、uh, without having to do through genetic modification. Thank you. Over to you, Mitsugi san. Thank you, Manuel. And the next questions.、Uh, お名前は書かれてませんけども、えー、これ一つ取り上げましょう、えー。ちょっと大きい課題ですけども、最も栄養な必要な人々に届くまでのサプライチェーンをどのように構築しますか先ほどのバリューチェーンの一環だと思うんですが、その栄養の足りてない人にどうやってこの魚を、サプライチェーンを届けていくのか、この点についてどうお考えでしょうか。Uh, Mitsugi san, sorry, but、uh, the interpretation does not seem to be working at the moment. So I, I, I didn't understand、okay. you. Correct me, translate、ah. it. The question is so, how do you just manage the supply chain to reach the people who are not enough、uh, nutrition? So, how do you access the malnutrition people s through the, this supply chain network? Okay, so、um, I think that you're asking that in, in terms of.、Um, Micronutrients, how you get access to those micronutrients.、Um, I think that you know, I think that there's a very good recognition, and I think that you may be referring to this question,、uh, this question on the chat that is in, in English about small scale fisheries、um, and,、uh, and their contribution to micronutrients. Is that, is that what you're referring to specifically? 
Yeah, this is a quality in a general question and it's coming from, yes. Yeah, so the thing is, um, we, we do know that uh, the, the best macronutrients come from small scale fish, sorry, small fish, not small scale fish, small, small fish, particularly those that you can eat uh, whole, uh, with including heads and bones. Those are the best uh, source of micronutrients. They're also in many respects, the most sustainable because they have a very short life cycle, generally a year. So you, you, you can exploit them uh, more. Inland fisheries are crucial for this, but also inland fisheries are some of the some of the least managed resources around the world. There's a lot of problems with the, with the management of inland fisheries, and, uh, and, and they are some of the species that have a highest impact. So we want to make sure that we recognize, and we do that already, that we recognize where is the best source of nutrition, and the best source of nutrition comes from the small fish, and to, uh, over time, ensure that uh, the, the micronutrient benefits are recognized. I can tell you that FAO um, is starting a new database of um, nutritional composition of fish species, so that over time we may be able to provide not just statistics of catches and landings and use and trade, but also of nutritional composition of what countries import and export and therefore the benefits for nutrition uh, and micronutrient deficiency analysis. Excellent. え、もう一つ、え、チャットボックスか、去年ボックスからえ、どのような需要金、需給均衡モデルを使われたのでしょうかという質問です。Thank what are your uh, our expectations of growth of the sectors in different in different under different conditions in different places? Uh, when it comes to fisheries, we have uh, an, uh, elements in there of um, management uh, enhancement, and therefore through that the achieve the achievement of the maximum sustainable yield targets uh, in different places. We also have incorporation of climate change. Um, expectations on impacts of production. So from the fisheries point of view, it's, it's completely uh, driven by, by supply and by how we think that the different management measures will actually address the challenges that are coming ahead. In the case of aquaculture, is based on uh, all our experts here in-house, looking at country by country and providing estimates of upper and lower growth potential based on a number of um, expectations which are aligned to the objectives of blue transformation. So when we combine those two, then you get these envelopes of growth of minimum and maximum, and, and the, those two targets um, uh, come into, into being. But it, it is not a supply-demand model. Thank you. Um, so, more one thing. すみません、今までとちょっと違う角度の質問があるので、これをもう一点取り上げます。そう、英語でチャットボックスに書かれてますが、would you please show some case about social inclusion and gender equality through the fisheries? So maybe we have the International Women's Day in the next month. This is quite a good question to you. Yes. Um... And sorry, I forgot something uh, again on the on the um, modeling, uh, Mitsugi-san. So if I can if I can uh, Please, complete the question, the answer before. So as I said, the blue transformation are not supply demand models, but the FAO and OECD produces every year a supply demand model that predicts fish production to uh, to the end of the decade, uh, and that is fully supply demand. And the results of that we compare with our blue transformation model. And they tend to be aligned in the sense that the average of the uh, supply demand FAO OECD model tends to uh, agree with the average of the blue transformation. And then we have in blue transformation an upper and a lower. So, so although this is not supply demand, it is, it is um, 
also incorporates a supply demand from the FAO OECD model. Now, in in the, the with respect to the second second question, social inclusion, gender equality, examples to that. Well, um, this is a very important part of the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, and it's an inter, a very significant and important part of everything that FAO does. Uh, and what we do uh, is, for example, we currently have um, significant funding uh, from uh, Norway that we are using to provide training through um, communities of uh, fisherwomen in Africa, particularly in West Africa. Uh, and what we do is that we're training them not so much on how to fish, of course, but how to add value to the products how to uh, be, understand how the market works, how to make them uh, facilitate the access to, the, to trade. And, and that process of training and education is empowering those communities uh, to do um, what they can. Another example that we have is, you know, we have a lot of work in, in Zanzibar in East Africa. There's a big community of seaweed farmers there, uh, and it is purely women driven. Uh, the men do not do the seaweed farming, it's only the women do the seaweed farming. And so what we are doing there is facilitating training again on how to maximize the use of that resource. So we, we train them on how to uh, develop and add value to that resource, create different products from the seaweeds, from soaps to, to gels, uh, not just food. And then again, how to uh, help them train them on how to develop that as a business. Um, how to get access to the markets and how to uh, interact them with the suppliers uh, and, and, and the, those around the world that are interested in that product. ありがとうございました。え、これで大体、え、今日のボックスの方の中身を終わらせたいと思いますが、え、またもう一人、え、今パネルの方からお一方お手が上がっておりますので、高松様お願いします。聞こえますか。はい、聞こえます。どうぞ。お願いします。素晴らしいプレゼンどうも。顔で画像を出せますか。はい。画像出ませんね。ちょっと申し訳ありません。声だけでお願いします。声だけでお願いします。どうぞお
So that's a big concern is that uh, how do we feed the tuna? So it's a, under the current environmental condition, it's quite uh, difficult to just to, to, to sustain that the feeding for the tuna. Yeah. So um, uh, technological advances in feeding uh, of uh, fish is, is one of the areas of aquaculture that has developed um, more uh, faster and more efficiently in, in, recent, in recent years. I don't know specifically the, the numbers on tuna that, that, the, um, that he mentioned, but for example, in the case of uh, salmon, it used to be four to five kilograms per every kilogram of, um, um, of uh, salmon, and now it's one to one. Uh, so, you know, there's a very significant contribution of alternative uh, feeds. Um, I mentioned early on that I was in Saudi Arabia th three weeks ago looking at shrimp farms and 82% of the feed in the shrimp, uh, uh, shrimp farms is actually soya and, and corn. Um, so there is a, actually a lot of development in the feeding and I suspect the same will happen uh, with tuna. But there's no doubt that the different fish species have different requirements. And so that very much uh, depends on the strategy of the country and the individual companies as to what they want aquaculture for. Um, aquaculture can be used as a business to develop income and that is uh, um, perfectly reasonable, but it also can be used to feed local populations. And that's when the role of government is important to make sure that there's an incentive for investment in particular types of aquaculture, depending on the objectives of the government. And so I do not want to interfere with that. Governments have to decide that by themselves, but there's a great potential. And, but the important element here is that for us in FAO, what is very important is to secure that we increase agriculture production in food deficit regions, in regions where otherwise the demand on land-based animal production will increase to the point where the environmental impact will be much, much larger. And that is with a particular objective that we have. はい、え、それではですね、随分時間も経過してきました。あの、この1年を過ごすにはとても良いタイミングのセミナーだったと思います。え、これからあの、また色んなもう少しえ具体的、個別具体的な課題についてはまずその都度え、不要を順次事務所とそれから不要本部の方で連携を取りながらですね、このような